Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the kitchen here at Odette Estate Winery. Um, my name is Adam. I am, uh, well, I should say, I run the events program for um, all of our wineries, uh, starting with Plump Jack Winery, uh, also up at the beautiful Cade Estate on top of Howell Mountain, here at Odette Estate, uh, and then now our new addition, uh, 13th Vineyard, um, which if you haven't had a chance to see it, as soon as you're let out of your houses and you can come out here and see it, we'd love to show it to you. Beautiful place. Uh, but anyways, we're going to bring it back here to Odette. Um, and I'm here with all of these incredible ingredients, um, some incredible Cabernet. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about how to pair wine, um, things to think about when you're pulling a wine bottle out of the cellar and you're thinking about what to make for dinner. Uh, it shouldn't be a scary thing. It should be a really, really fun thing. Um, so first thing, if you're like me, you're going to need probably one and two bottles of Cabernet, one for cooking, one for dinner. Uh, I already decanted one for, uh, for cooking. So if you haven't gotten a chance to get out your ingredients, pour yourself a glass of wine, uh, please do because that's what I'm going to do. So let's start with a little glass of uh, 2017 Cade Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, one of my very favorites on our new releases. Oh, yeah. Okay, we've got all these really great ingredients here, and I'm going to talk about them in just a minute. But I want to start uh, sort of talking about food and wine pairing. Um, Running the events program, that's probably the number one question that I get. Because events, it's all about food, and it's all about wine, and then you kind of bring those together to make a party. Um, and so we are constantly making recommendations about the food and the wine and how to bring them together. Um, I'm not a professional chef. I'm a home chef. I just do this for fun. But if you have a few simple things that you take into consideration, you can really make food and wine very, very easy. Uh, let's speak in very broad strokes here. Sauvignon Blanc. What are the most simple components of Sauvignon Blanc? High acidity, low body. Chardonnay. Nice big body, maybe a little bit lower uh, uh, acidity. Pinot Noir. Classic for those really soft bodies, and again, very soft tannins, which tannins you can pretty much think of as a bitterness. Cabernet Sauvignon, that's why we love it. Big body, big tannins, that's what you want. So if you think about the three things that, cat, or I'm sorry, that wine really, really has going for it um, are acidity and um, possibly sweetness and bitterness. But the things that it doesn't have, that would be fattiness, saltiness, and spiciness. So when it comes to pairing food and wine, you have a couple of options. You can try to find things that it doesn't have, that will complement it, or you can find things that it already has and play off of each other. Um, I like to think about it like this. Let's say you make uh, a nice bright summer salad. That's my favorite. This time of year, oh, my favorite food is coming out of the market. You make that salad, and if you're like me, you're gonna have lots of fresh greens, you're going to take one of those California avocados, you're going to carve it up, throw that on top, add a big pile of burrata, 
and now you're looking for a glass of wine to go with it. And you could reach for the very classic pairing of a beautiful California Chardonnay, something like the 2017 Odette, I'm sorry, 2018 Odette Reserve Chardonnay. Excellent pairing, but that's a congruent pairing, something that really shows the balance of the two. Creaminess, bright, fresh flavor, against that creaminess of the burrata and the fattiness of the avocado. Or you can grab a bottle of that 2018 Cade Estate Sauvignon Blanc and the bright, fresh flavors that the salad lacks and that bright acidity are gonna really play off of each other, creating a contrasting pairing. And so today, we're gonna talk about congruent pairings, things that go well together because the flavors you recognize in the food are the flavors that you're recognizing in the wine. And so, while you may think that something like seared ahi tuna is not meant to go with Cabernet Sauvignon, I'm here to prove you're wrong. So, the first thing we're gonna do today is we're gonna talk a little bit about the, uh, the spices. You should have that recipe with you. There's a few things today that we've gone ahead and prepped out ahead of time just for, um, for time's sake. But uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is the spices. Now this Cabernet has a beautiful flavors of, classically, roasted coffee. One of my favorites. I know we're supposed to uh, stay as local as possible, but Stumptown Coffee coming out of the Pacific Northwest, that's my home. Happy Mother's Day, Mama. Um, that is probably one of my favorites. Another you classically see, and some people will be like, I've never heard of it before. What is it? Cocoa nibs. Oh, beautiful. Now this, cocoa nibs, or cacao nibs, these are um, basically chocolate in its raw form. So it's not going to have that rich sweetness, just a touch, but it's really going to have that beautiful bitterness and umami quality that you really can't find in anything else. Mm. Love coconuts. Next, cardamom. Cardamom. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with cardamom, it's a really, really great spice. Um, but you'll see in your instructions for this recipe, you need to toast these, break them open, and just take the little brown and black seeds out of the inside. You don't want to be eating the holes of these, um, but I highly recommend that you find the nice pods, get the pods, do it that way. You're not going to want to buy the already ground stuff. Chili powder. Chili powder is great. It's not overly spicy. It just creates that sense of spiciness without being uh, aggressive to your palate. Cinnamon. Oh. Thyme. And of course, two things make all food great. Butter and salt. So all of those together, thrown into either your mortar and pestle, or I cheat, I like to use, just use a coffee grinder. And we're gonna create this excellent spice. I call it uh, my cocoa nib and coffee rub spice. We got Houston in the house, What's Texas. Up, Texas. Some uh, new friends you made last night on a virtual tasting are tuning in right now. Awesome. <laughs> as well awesome. as uh, Rhode Island. Yes. Showing some love. Oh, cool. Rhode Island. I've never been to Rhode Island, but um, I've always kind of wanted to go just to see like what's happening in Rhode Island. Kind of like Delaware. You have no reason to go to Delaware, but why not? <laughs> so, um, yes, we have a question from Facebook. We do. So, you've talked about the, the food and wine pairings a bit. George wants to know... Um, the he usually just has steak with cab so what elements of the steak make that a good pairing you know we um we usually recommend you know this 2017 k steak cabernet uh you know our our winemaker danielle sorrell her and her team they put their heart and souls into making this cabernet um, and it's so beautiful and then i have to throw a little special uh shout out to a dear friend um, our tasting room manager up at k State, kevin ferry because he's the one who says, you should never drink this wine unless you've got a big fat piece of prime rib or a uh, T-bone steak in front of you. Um, and I kind of agree, 
but I'm here to you know show him wrong uh, because this tuna is actually going to allow us to uh, to sort of replicate what you classically love about steak and cabernet pairings. Steak has a high fat content, um, and so that fattiness you want bitterness and acidity and body to help cut through that. And Cabernet Sauvignon does that. So that's why it's a really simple, easy pairing for people to understand. Um, but something like tuna, while it has a delicate flavor, that fattiness is very similar to, uh, to big beef. Um, and then we're gonna play with uh, spices to really play off the beautiful flavor in the Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, one last little shout out I wanna throw out today. Um, I know I said Happy Mother's Day to my own mother um, up there in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, but one other person, because I have to, she's my boss. Hashtag Lisa Sedgley. Um, we want to say Mom of the Year. Have another thing. <laughs> so, yes, one more question from Facebook before we get started. Um, they want to know where they can find the recipe if they're joining in late or didn't see the email this morning. Yes, uh, you, I believe, can find the recipe posted on our Instagram page. Uh, there is a, uh, an actual just post. And um, down in the body of our posts, our news feed at, uh, on the Cage Facebook page, you should be able to find the recipe uh, loaded there as well. Um, and if you um, reach out to us directly uh, over the weekend, I'll be glad to, uh, to send you a copy of the recipe as well if you're not able to find it on our social media pages. Okay, we're gonna get started. Uh, first thing, I talked about the spices. We've already gone and pulverized these all. Uh, and we're going to go right into um, prepping the tuna. So I've sourced a sushi grade uh, ahi tuna. Um, on your recipe, it says a number one or a number two plus. Uh, there are grading systems of tuna. Um, but what you're looking for is you want a nice bright pink color, very tight. Um, segmentation. If it's starting to fall apart at any of the, um, the little flaky points, um, then it's just not a high quality enough tuna. Probably been frozen, um, also probably has been taken from um, a much more immature fish. Uh, and we are also looking for that beautiful little marbling. You'll see these streams of fat running right through. You can really see them there on the center. Um, I've already prepped this in two smaller segments. You can do a whole steak if you like. Uh, it really, really doesn't matter. So, first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna brush this tuna. Let me find my brush. With a nice extra virgin olive oil. The first pressing, one of my favorites. You know, I have this Italian chef friend. He swears by olive oil as being the best chapstick and hair gel that exists on the market. Classic Italians. Anyways, so we're going to start by just brushing right over the top, all the way around. And I'll just go ahead and brush both of these before we get too far ahead of ourselves. It doesn't take much. It doesn't need to be sparkling, I mean, it doesn't, or it doesn't need to be soaking wet, um, but you do want it to have that little bit of sheen just enough. Really what we're trying to achieve here is we just want to give that nice base for our rub to stick to. And we're going to be done with that for a moment. So, I should have mentioned, we've also laid out um, some saran wrap. Uh, sorry, plastic wrap. I realize saran's a brand. Um, we are going to then Take some of that thyme, cocoa, chili powder, salt, and, uh, and coffee rub. We're gonna sprinkle right over the top, we'll both sides of these. And we're gonna cover everything. So if you need to pick it up, it doesn't have to be super pretty, just kind of rub it in there. You'll get your hands messy, that's part of the fun of cooking, you know. I drink wine and I cook all the time, and all my wine glasses will have you know, smudge prints and they'll be all covered in spices and stuff. But hey, it's just fun. You're at home. It's a lot more fun being a home chef than a real chef, I think. Because you're going to play around. Nobody's there to criticize you except for you and your family. Um, and all the great recipes I've ever come up with, they've always been tested and tried out on my family. Um, my mother and my father, they can attest. My dad, 
He's eating things that are probably incredibly foul. Um, all in the name of, you know, me exploring and becoming a better home chef. So. Well, Barbara Sawchuk is already giving you some props. Thank you, Barbara. You know it looks good. Thank you, Barbara. Barbara is a beautiful human being uh, and a dear friend who lives here in Napa Valley. Um, and thank you, Barbara. I really, really appreciate that. So, here's kind of the fun part. Uh, let me get my wine glass out of the way so I don't want If you're cooking along, great, but if you're drinking along, even better. So we're gonna tightly wrap these. Um, this is gonna allow all of that flavor to really seal to the tuna um, and to really become a part of the tuna. That's what we're looking for. So saran wraps out, steak, or, you know, tuna steaks are down, just wrap it over, roll. Then the fun part here at the end, all you gotta do, throw it a little twist, wrap it up. You're gonna to wanna to set this aside, let it rest at room temperature, oh, maybe about 30 minutes. Should give you time to accomplish some of the other tasks in the recipe. Um, if you need to and, uh, and want to you know, need an hour, hour and a half, throw it in the fridge, bring it out about 20 minutes ahead of time, let it sit at room temperature. Um, this is going to, uh, to let you get that nice, hard, crispy crust on the outside. So. We're gonna finish these, and then we're gonna move on. And we're gonna take care of the fennel part of the salad. Uh, because that's something that can also be done a little bit of time ahead. For those of you who are trying to follow along today, uh, just as a heads up, uh, the couscous, which is going to be part of the salad, uh, has already been prepped and cooked. Um, this is essentially the look that you're going for. I love this couscous and I'm going to talk lots more about it um, once we get to the point where we're going to assemble the salad. Um, but if you'd like to go ahead and get started on that if you're cooking along, please do. Um, and then we'll be bringing it into the, uh, into the display once we um, are ready to assemble the salad. Can, Chef, can you remind us one more time what you're drinking along yes. with this uh, pairing? So I am drinking the 2017 Cade Estate Cabernet Sauvignon, all grown up there at uh, between about 1,500 and 1,800 feet of elevation on Howell Mountain. Um, one of the most unique places to grow Cabernet Sauvignon. Facebook. Um, why are you decanting it? Partly, I decanted this uh, because if you were with us last week um, when John and Sandra and uh, Aaron Miller, our winemaker at Plump Jack, we're talking all about the benefits of screw caps, um, which I am actually drinking today. It's one of our Cane State Cabernets under a screw cap closure. Um, you may have heard John say, um, really take the, uh, you know, if you enjoy beautiful, bold Cabernet, um, take a moment and invest in a nice decanter. Um, it doesn't have to be, you know, extravagant with beautiful fine pieces of crystal coming off the side. It can just be a nice round bottom decanter. Um, and what that does is it allows you to pour the wine uh, ahead of time, introduce a little bit of oxygen, and help break down some of the, uh, the bolder tannins that are uh, resting on the front, mostly for these new vintages. Um, and it really lets it show the soft sort of fruity texture and beautiful, almost like floral nature in, in the wine. And so I made the decision today to uh, follow John's advice and decant uh, one of our Cabernet Sauvignons. So, fennel, also uh, referred to as anise. Um, one of my favorite ingredients um, in all of cooking. Um, and so what we're gonna start with, these are called the fronds, stems and fronds. Um, and you don't really want to eat these. Uh, they can be, be discarded, put into your compost, uh, but you can also save them and reserve them for if you were to make a, a chicken stock or a vegetable stock. Um, they're a beautiful addition to one of those. So we're just going to cut off, take some of that green off, set that aside, put that in our compost. Down here at the bottom, you have the bare root. 
I usually like to shave a quarter inch or so right off the top. Now I'm done with the knife because if you really, really, really love thinly sliced anything, potato chips, fennel, zucchini, anything, go ahead, ooh, go ahead buy yourself a mandolin. However, always, please, always use the guard. So, that didn't work. So what you have here is a very thin blade. You can usually change out your guard so you can get a thicker cut or a thinner cut. And we're gonna go on a thin cut today. If you just have a knife, that's fine too. Um, just go ahead and slice very, as thin of uh, wedges as you possibly can. And, We're just gonna take this whole bowl all the way down. Anise, um, some people will describe this as uh, almost like a licorice. Um, it's a little bit sweet, it's a little bit bitter. Um, it's incredibly unique. If you have any of that root, go ahead and just pop those pieces right out. Really what you want is this excellent fleshy pieces right here. You don't need to chop these up. What we're going to do is we're going to marinate these for about half an hour um, and it's going to take some of that sharp uh, edge off of the flavor, um, give us a little bit of acidity. So, let me grab my bowl. We're done with the mandolin. Every home chef has learned their lesson on a mandolin. Um, you buy one, you think you can do it without the guard, and then you shave part of your finger off. So, if you've never done it, please take my, uh, my recommendation, and I'm sure lots of other home chefs use the guard every single time. So, what we're gonna do is we're going to sprinkle this with a little salt. When I say a pinch, I know it sounds, you think of a pinch, you think of a little two finger pinch. That's not a pinch. A pinch, that's a pinch. Three fingers, sprinkle right over the top. I know it seems like a lot, but it's gonna taste great. Take a nice extra virgin olive oil. It's about one ounce. Then we're gonna take a little bit of our champagne vinegar. Again, one more ounce. Eh. Go ahead and use this. I'm just gonna toss that. Let it just really, you know, make sure everything's coated. Um, there's not much that you need to do. You're just going to let this sit and rest uh, for about 30 minutes. Um, again, you can make this ahead of time because it is going to be served cold. Um, so rest this, set it aside. We're going to come back to this in a few minutes. All right, let me just clean up my space and I'll answer some questions. Um, so someone noticed that you were describing the wine with um, some kind of like food flavors. Is there a reason you do that? You know, it's hard to, everything has to be described based on something that you're familiar with. Um, and there really has never been a language written for wine. Um, and so the easiest way to understand it uh, can generally be by describing it compared to something else. Um, but kind of romantically, the way I think about it is that um, wine and food have been, they were born together, they grew up together, um, and have continued to always be a, a pairing. Um, you re rarely will open up a bottle of wine without um, you know, trying to at least have incorporate some kind of food. Um, and so really it's all about you know, identifying those flavors, those aromas in the wine, and, um, and identifying what food might actually go well with it. Um, and so if you think about it, if you smell that great bright cherry flavor, which this Cabernet has, um, then perhaps you know, dried cherries might be a great pairing. Um, and so that's the way I like to think about it. 
is that we describe wine like food because it is um, really the best way of understanding how to put that wine with food. So, next step, we're going to make the vinaigrette. The vinaigrette um, is uh, a key component. Um, when people ask me, you know, why is it that when I go out to eat, I seem to enjoy the food, you know, so much more than I want to make it at home. And I say, well, one is they don't care about your health. Uh, so they're using twice as much butter as you would, three times as much salt as you would, but they're also um, incorporating sauces. And sauces are key to almost every dish. Uh, and so this vinaigrette is going to play as our sauce. So get yourself a non-reactive bowl uh, because we are going to be playing with um, some vinegars and oils and you want either glass or stainless steel. Um, we are going to start um, by chopping up a shallot. This is going to be a whole shallot. Um, here, I'll move this bowl out of the way so you can see what I'm doing. Now, a shallot um, is very much like, it's in the onion family. Uh, it has uh, an incredible flavor. Um, what I like to do is to chop off that tip, pull that outer layer right off, and we're just going to peel this back. Take the skin off, all that fleshy meat, that's what you want. Now, you notice we didn't cut off the root, because that's going to help hold this whole thing together while we chop it up. So we're going to cut that in half. We're going to segment that. And we'll probably go ahead right down the middle. But you notice it's all being held together, which makes it really easy to get through these fine chops. And we'll do the same thing with the other one. Where did you learn your cutting technique here, <laughs> Adam? So, I am, again, I said, I'm not a trained chef. Um, I am a home chef. Uh, this is all just out of the passion of things that I like to do. Um, my brother uh, is a trained chef um, who has worked in some of the finest wine country restaurants uh, around. Um, and so I've always relied on his uh, recommendations. Uh, but, I mean, this is a lot of the stuff, stuff that you can learn you know, yourself if you have the right tools. Um, always have a sharp knife. Always keep your fingers away from the sharp end, um, and just control your control your cuts. So, shallot in. Now we're going to grab some of this beautiful Italian parsley. You just need about three sprigs. That's good. Um, we're going to take the uh, just the leaves right off. Nice and easy. We can get rid of the stalks. We don't need that. The leaves are really where all that beautiful spice and freshness come from. The sprays would just add too much bitterness uh, to this vinaigrette. And I'm a firm believer in that you should recognize the food that you're eating. Um, so there's no need to chop the living out of it. Um, you can just really leave it pretty coarse. Um, that's kind of the nice thing about fresh spices is that you should be able to recognize what you're working with here. Maybe we'll give it one more pass. But there we go. So we're going to pick all that up. We're going to throw that in our bowl. So now we've got shallot, parsley, we're going to add a little lemon zest. When you're zesting a lemon, it should just be a couple of short rubs. You don't want to take a whole bunch of the white pith out. That's 
too much bitterness. Pound it. Take that. Lemon zest. We're going to add our lemon juice. Old fashioned grandma's juicer. You can use any juicer you like. You can use a fork in your own hands. But this is going to ask for about one ounce, uh, which is about a whole lemon. We're then going to blend in, pardon me for having to double check my recipe. Uh, we are going to look at about an ounce of uh, eighth sherry vinegar. That's not going to work. There's an ounce of sherry vinegar. We're going to get our whisk. And then for those of you who are familiar making uh, vinaigrettes, um, this is the key. It's going to be about four, ounce of, four ounces of extra virgin olive oil and about two ounces of walnut oil. If you're allergic to nuts, you can use another real rich oil, um, something like an avocado oil, uh, grapeseed oil. Um, I really, really love walnut oil. I don't have any nut allergies in my family, so I get the benefit of using this. This is going to be a very, very slow drizzle while also keeping your whisk going. If you have a food processor, you can do it the same way, just slowly drizzling in. Um, and so I'm going to start mixing, and I'm going to answer any questions. Who are, uh, who are some of your favorite well-known chefs? Some of my favorite well-known chefs. Well, uh, one of my favorite chefs uh, is uh, a gentleman named Ryan Fancher. Um, and Ryan Fancher uh, was the executive chef of a restaurant in Healdsburg. Um, also beautiful wine country, um, and is now the executive chef uh, for two restaurants in the San Luis Obispo Hotel. Brand new property, beautiful. Um, and Ryan was, um, holds a near and dear place in my heart. Uh, he, uh, I worked, I used to work in restaurants on the front service side. Um, and Ryan brought my brother, Darren, um, in as a young, uh, inexperienced cook um, and turned him into a great chef. So he played, you know, he holds a very special place in my heart. Um, I would also say that he hasn't gotten the best press lately, uh, but there's something about Gordon Ramsay that I just can't deny. I love the man. Um, sometimes it's just all about telling people off. And how often do you have to practice your cross coordination with uh, this whisking action and the pouring? Well, I am, um, you know, luckily I have a food process at home, but it's more enjoyable to watch this, you know, happen with a whisk. Um, basically, what we're looking for is for that oil to actually emulsify and connect with the vinegar. Um, if it was to be resting on top, you wouldn't have that cloudy look to it. And so uh, this is something that you're just looking for, but that's basically our vinaigrette. It's going to be, you know, not a salad dressing. Um, this is something that we're using as a sauce. Bright, fresh flavors. It's going to be served over that couscous. Uh, and so we're going to come back to that um, in a few minutes. You can make this ahead of time, even days, weeks ahead of time. Store it in the refrigerator. Um, just so you know, when you make homemade dressings, a lot of times that olive oil, it's going to want to revert back to a solid state um, when it's in the refrigerator. So if it sits for too long in the fridge and becomes solid, take it out, bring it up to room temperature, give it a heavy shake, um, and it's going to be just fine. So we're going to set that aside and come back to it. All right. Next. Here, check on the time, we should be good. I know Instagram is under a time limit, so I'm gonna keep checking on that. But uh, if we start running out of time, I'll let you know where to go on Instagram. All right, so now we're gonna get to the cooking. We've got all of our ingredients prepped, um, and we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna cook that tuna. It's been sitting long enough, um, and we're going to cook the fennel. Um, so if you're following along, um, for the tuna, go ahead, get your pan nice and hot. 
You can use a griddle, which we're going to use today for the fennel, um, but I'm going to use um, my favorite cooking instrument, cast iron. Um, we're going to use this for uh, cooking that, or that tuna, and then we'll use the griddle for the fennel. Um, if you're getting ready for the fennel, go ahead and get your ice bath ready. Nothing fancy, just ice, water, make sure it's nice and cold. And so this pan is nice and hot, lightly oiled, you'll see. Not much really dripping off, it's just glistening. So here's that tuna. We're going to unwrap. And you'll see. See how all that spice has really become a part of the tuna. It's a little bit crumblier over here, but you know, like right there, it's barely even coming off. That's exactly what you're looking for. Okay. Terrific. Yeah, my pan is already nice and hot. So let's see here, my camera ladies, they're probably gonna come around and take a look at this. I'm gonna go ahead and just throw all uh, both of these in. Um, we're gonna turn them every once in a while. We're not cooking this tuna all the way through. This is definitely going to be uh, considered a rare cooking. So it's gonna have a nice crust on the outside, but when we slice into these, they will be um, bright pink classic tuna on the inside. So, get a little bit of that sizzle going. This is a good time to ask questions because it's kind of boring for me to just sit here and cook. Um, but we're going to let it sit, oh, 90 seconds um, on each side. And we're just going to turn, um, turn these over and over as they, uh, as they cook. And I think, to save a little bit of time, yes, go ahead and Instagram. Adam, is there a danger in pulling them off too soon when they're not ready? There is not much of a danger. Um, tuna has uh, very, very, very little, um, especially a high quality sushi grade tuna, um, you can essentially eat um, as long as it's been held at a proper temperature without cooking. So there's not a, uh, a risk of taking it off too soon. You don't need a meat thermometer. Um, what this is gonna do is that 90 seconds, it's gonna allow you to um, to get to that classic ring all the way around, where it'll be a white ring and then in the center will be pink. Um, and so we'll see that once we slice it open. Um, but you know, don't don't stress out too much if you think you might have taken it off a little bit too soon. We're gonna go ahead and take a look at turning these. I'm gonna turn my heat up just a little bit. Whoa, cooking with gas. So you'll see, we've now created this crust, it's a little bit, you can kind of feel it when you're working with your tools. Um, it should be you know, a little bit harder. You can see that the meat is starting to turn a little bit white. And so we're just gonna let that cook there for a little bit. Um, for some people that have just kind of tuned in, yeah. um, a reminder, why the, why the tuna with the Cabernet? Yeah, so we are, um, so if you're just tuning in and you missed my whole introduction, um, my name is Adam. I run the events program for Cade, Plump Jack, and Odette Wineries. Uh, we're here in the commercial kitchen at Odette where um, we bring in private chefs and catering companies to produce incredible events um, in our estate lounge, looking out over our vineyards, enjoying some of the best cabernet you can find all around. Um, and so today, we're focusing on the 2017 Cade Estate Cabernet. And we're talking about ways to pair something other than steak uh, with your Cabernet. And let me just get to this and flip it. And so instead of focusing on steak and Cabernet, which everybody does, we thought, why not think about something that's a little bit more summery? Um, everybody's starting to warm up, you're starting to eat outside. Um, we should be able to find a way to bring classic seared ahi tuna and make it a Cabernet pairing. Uh, and so we've used things like roasted coffee, 
cocoa nibs, chili powder, thyme, cinnamon, cardamom, one of my favorites, and created a rub that is going to make this seared tuna resemble the wine that we're pairing it with. It's all about creating similar flavors and highlighting the incredible work that Danielle Soro, our winemaker at Cade, um, and her team are putting so much time and attention into. So you'll see, I mean, we've been doing this for four minutes. I just put it onto its fourth side, um, and we're starting to get that nice hard crust. This bigger piece over here, I'll probably have to let it sit a little bit longer. Um, and, you know, once, once we get it seared on all sides, we're going to set it aside. We're going to put this onto a nice chilled plate, and we're going to throw it back into the fridge um, to rest until we're ready to serve it. This is a cold dish, again, to be enjoyed you know, in the summer when it's, if it's anything like, you know, it is here anywhere else. Um, we've had 90 degree days for the last two weeks, so it feels like summer's already here. All right, we're going to let that finish up. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and grab that fennel. We're going to put that onto the, uh, onto the griddle. If you don't have a griddle at home, that's okay. Uh, what you can do is just use, again, a cast iron pan or any heavy bottom flat bottom can or pan. Um, this has been marinating. Uh, it should have kind of shrunk in size a little bit. We're going to throw this right onto a nice medium hot to high uh, pan or griddle. We're going to cook this for, oh, maybe two to three minutes, just long enough to uh, draw out a little bit of translucency as well as uh, an incredible caramelization. Yeah, Facebook. Um, some of the ingredients, if I can't find them at my local supermarket, what, what some substitutes could potentially work? Yeah, you know, um, cocoa nibs are probably one of those things that you're thinking, like, I've never seen them, I don't know where to find them. You're going to want to look in your baking section, um, because classically it's a baking uh, ingredient. Um, so take a look there. Uh, if you can't find it, find a really high percentage cocoa, um, like a chocolate bar that is 80% chocolate, or 80% cocoa, I should say. Um, that is going to, sorry, I don't want to let these get out of control here. We've got a hotter pan than I anticipated. But that is going to uh, mimic a lot of the same flavors that cocoa nib is going to mimic. Uh, fennel, you should be able to find it almost anywhere, but um, you know, any kind of specialty marker, not even a specialty market, uh, but if you really, really cannot, um, try a turnip or any other root vegetable. Um, it's going to create really beautiful flavors in your dish. Okay, again, you'll see I've got this incredible caramelization happening. So we're going to actually pull this off. It took less time than I figured um, on this hotter griddle. In your pan, it may take a little bit longer. I've got my ice bath. We want to stop the cooking process. So this is going to completely arrest it. Um, we're going to throw these in. It's going to get kind of cloudy. It's not going to look too beautiful, but it's going to stop that cooking process. So you're going to have that slight translucency. It's going to keep the, uh, the fennel and have that kind of caramelization flavor really great vinegar um, that's been soaked in there, and it's going to keep that crunch. That's what we're looking for. All right, just a couple more pieces. We're going to check on our tuna one more time. I'm going to show you kind of where we're at. So, tuna, I'm going to say most likely this piece right here, we're going to take that out of the pan. We're going to let this one cook for just another minute, probably on that side. And then we're going to take these off, put them on a chilled plate, and set it aside for uh, just a little bit later when we're ready to plate. What are we smelling? 
It smells really good. I know, doesn't it smell good? What you're smelling is um, that chocolate and that cocoa, or sorry, the cocoa and the uh, the coffee searing on the pan. Plus, we just finished this um, really beautiful. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited! I love that. Um, this here, that caramelization. Caramelization is basically a rapid process of converting uh, sugars, um, natural sugars that. Um, kind of taste that sweetness, turning it really into that caramel. Um, and so we're gonna let that make sure it's nice and cool. Oh man, I'm getting hungry now. Okay, so we are about 12 minutes away from Instagram kicking us off. I'm guessing that we're somewhere between 10 and 15 minutes away from finishing. So if you get kicked off on Instagram, go ahead and log into Facebook. Or uh, you can also log into Facebook and watch the end. This is all going to be saved both on our YouTube page um, and on our Facebook page. I'll give you one last kind of check-in before we officially get kicked off. All right. So we're going to set this aside, let it dry out a one little bit. I'm just going to actually use the same bowl that we were using for the fennel anyways. It's already already nice and cold. The cooking process has stopped. And we can set that aside. We're going to start assembling the salad. Um, and then at that point, we'll be ready to pretty much plate the whole thing up. Here, we'll give everyone a look. We'll put that right up front. So that's our tuna. Doesn't that look like a great steak? I keep, I keep forgetting to drink wine. I'm focusing on cooking. If I was at home, I'd be drinking more than I would be cooking. Um, but, all right, what are we gonna do? We're gonna assemble our salad. And then, we're gonna get everything ready to plate. So, let's get a nice bowl and we're gonna, I always like to when I'm assembling a salad like this, I hate putting ingredients into dry vessels. Um, it just seems like they kind of stick and lose their flavor. I don't know what it is. It might just be completely in my own head. Um, but I'm a huge fan of olive oil, so I'm just gonna hit this wooden bowl here. A little bit of olive oil. And we're gonna start with that couscous. So this is uh, called pearl couscous or Israeli couscous. Um, it's called couscous because the food's so nice. I named it twice. Um, and this pearl couscous is unlike that grainy, sandy couscous that you may think of and probably hate. Um, this is much more like a beautiful pasta. Um, this is something um, we and through the cooking process, um, if you follow the directions that are in the recipe, what we've done is we've heated some water, we've added some marjoram, we added turmeric and paprika. If you don't really like turmeric and you don't like paprika, you can substitute with something like saffron, throw a little couple threads of saffron in instead. Um, and we let that rest, and then we um, bring that temperature back up again, take the sprigs of marjoram out, um, add your toasted couscous and cook to an al dente. Run under cold water um, in, a, in a sieve or uh, a colander. Um, and what you end up with is this bright yellow, very flavorful, excellent texture. A little bit gummy, but, um, but a little bit chewy. Um, and so we're just gonna throw all that in there. Pull that out. Perfect. Second ingredient, Castle Vestrano olives. If you're not familiar with Castle Vestrano olives, uh, you can find these already pitted, which is great. Um, bright green, crunchy, young harvested olives. Um, one of my favorite Italian varietals. Uh, it has a beautiful fatty flavor, uh, much like avocado, um, but the crunchier texture. Um, which makes it great for, you know, a Cabernet pairing that, again, we were just talking about. Fattiness blended with acidity and bitterness um, is what really creates a solid pairing. So, we're going to throw 
I think we're going to throw all this in here. Yeah, why not? Next, we are going to add our fennel. Pick up a couple ice cubes. That's okay. Fennel. Let that co-mingle. Again, this is another salad that you can you can just let sit. You know, it's kind of like a stroganoff. The longer you let it sit and marry, the more beautiful the flavors really become. Um, I honestly, I love this salad the next day more than I did the first day I made it. We're gonna again throw a little bit of salt on there. We're gonna throw. Where did my zester go? A little bit of lemon zest. And of course, I started the whole thing with olive oil. I'm gonna finish the whole thing with olive oil. Just a little bit, just to keep it moist. And essentially, this is going to be the bed of your salad. Does that look good? That's to me. Um, okay. Next, tuna. We're gonna grab our fish knife. If you like cooking fish, um, I highly recommend that you spend the $100 on a quality fish knife. Uh, it's gonna make your life so much easier. Uh, it's gonna allow you to cut those thin slices cleanly through um, raw fillets and cooked fillets. Um, but we're gonna go ahead and cook these two, or cut these two beautiful pieces of ahi tuna. So um, I'm gonna aim for about, you know, three quarters of an inch to one inch medallions. It's up to you. If you like them thicker, cut them thicker. If you like them thinner, please cut them thinner. But look at that. See, beautiful bright pink on the inside. That light crust of white. That's the cooked, uh, the cooked tuna. Uh, this is your medium rare tuna. And then we have uh, this incredible cocoa nib and coffee rub making up the crust. So we're just gonna here set that one aside. Chef Adam, yeah. what brand do you recommend for a fish knife investment? You know, there are great knives um, made by several companies. Uh, the Japanese steel is obviously um, stand out among some of the very best. Um, but if you're just looking for, if you're not a professional chef and you're just looking for a nice set of knives, um, really you can find a great Wusthof knife, um, German made. Um, that's what this particular one is here. Um, it's been you know used lovingly for several years. Um, but uh, but yeah, a nice made you know German steel or Japanese steel if you really really want to invest. Um, you can find some really terrific knives. That wants to start breaking apart. Oh my gosh, I am really excited. We'll get rid of those ones. That's gonna be one plate. See, that, that one we cook maybe just a little bit on the longer side, but not too bad. Oh great. Perfect. So we got our two plates right there for one filet. Um, if you're just making appetizers, you know, maybe you've made enough for a couple people. Um, but, you know, it's really, really up to you. The recipe that I gave you, uh, the idea is to cook for four. Um, so uh, hopefully if you're not eating too much um, or drinking too much, uh, that would be enough for four people. Um, so I'm going to grab a plate. We're going to go ahead and assemble this. Uh, you're going to need your vinaigrette and you're going to need um, your salad and then we're going to be done here. So, Chef, why did you decide to pull off or set aside the end pieces of your tuna? So if I was just cooking for, well actually that's not true. I was going to say if I was just cooking for, uh, for my wife and for me, um, I would have just thrown them on the plate because it's just pieces of food. Um, but I, I actually hold myself to a pretty high standard sometimes, or as my wife would call me, a snob. Um, and they're not the most beautiful pieces. Uh, and so um, just kind of like in a restaurant, uh, which is where I come from on the front of house side things, um, 
I typically will, uh, will discard the end so that I can create a beautiful plating. Um, it's just a preference. There's nothing wrong with them. Uh, eat them up. I'll probably, you know, eat these up later off camera. Um, but we're going to go ahead and play something beautiful that you can be proud of presenting in front of your friends and family and uh, whoever else you have. So, um, get yourself a nice plate. Um, I like white plates. Uh, this is a little piece of stoneware, so a little texture to it. It's kind of nice. Got my salad. Aunt Diane says, great job, Adam. So proud <laughs> of you. Loves and hugs. Loves and hugs, Aunt Diane. Love you too. Oh, the joy of having your family watching and then you'll get the phone calls afterwards. So, you know, I think that's probably about as, as much as I would want for an early evening dinner. Save the rest for later in the afternoon. Kind of tuck that up. Um, if you've ever wondered why uh, you know you feel like you know you're not comfortable plating, um, and you really wish that you could be, there's tons of really great articles and blogs all about learning how to plate food and how to visually conceptualize what you want to make. Um, but if you want just a few simple rules, um, dimension really matters. Uh, and so if um, you know when you know obviously you want to have clean hands, um, but you know kind of. Create a little bit of height in your food. A little bit of something to look at, you know, other than just a flat plate. Um, and then obviously, try to create everything to the shape of your plate. If you have a square plate, you might want to arrange things a little bit more in a rectangular fashion. If you have things on a round plate, you might want to throw everything a little bit on the round. Um, I'm going to go ahead and set that steak aside. I'm going to use this steak right here. These five pieces. Um, I like really odd numbers. Um, and so things always look better when they're plated in threes, fives, sevens. Um, and we're just going to keep all three of those together. And yeah, we'll throw them. We're just going to throw them right there on their side so everyone can see that like, beautiful color, bright pink, nice crust, really nice. We'll arrange that just a little bit. And then the last thing that we're going to do, Instagram, I'm going to lose you in like two minutes. I'm really sorry if I do. Please uh, check us out on Facebook, also YouTube. Check in on our websites. We'll have all of the, uh, the rest of this uh, presentation um, posted up there as well. Um, I'm going to grab that vinaigrette. Grab a little spoon. I'll throw a little bit of finish on it. Make sure that you get some of the shallots, some of the fresh Italian parsley, that olive oil, and don't be shy. Just throw it on there, you know. People want to see, they want to see that fresh oil and that beautiful green. Awesome. Oh man, I'm excited. All right, I'm going to clean this up just a little bit. You know, get some of that oil off of the edge of the plate. Nancy Bourne loves the recipe. Uh, Thank she, you, Nancy. She downloaded the PDF and wants to know if there's written instructions somewhere. I think it's on page two. I believe it's but. all on page two, yeah. So the first page is gonna have all the ingredients for the individual components. Um, and then page two will have all the written out uh, instructions. The glorious thing about this recipe is that you can make a lot of this stuff, um, you know, even the day ahead of time, stored in the fridge. It's gonna be a cold dish that you're serving here, which sometimes I want a cold dinner in the middle of you know July, August, September, and October. So um, I'm super excited. I have not had enough Cabernet, so I'm gonna grab myself a nice fork, grab myself a nice knife, and I'm gonna dig in. We're gonna talk a little bit about the flavors, talk about the pairing of the wine. Um, but if you have more questions, please feel free to reach out to our team. We're here to answer your questions, send you wine, um, this K to State Cabernet is awesome. We want to send you as much as you can possibly drink. So please reach out to us and let us know. Uh, let's see here. Where did I put it? Right there. We're going to move my cutting knife. We'll clean my cutting board just a little bit. Lee Portland says Pamela is going to make it tonight. Thank you, Cade. We love you. Thank you. Thank you. Tony and Becky Sperlin says it looks delicious. Thank you very much. You know, I like rustic food. Instagram. 
See ya. Wouldn't want to be ya. Go to Facebook. <laughs> um, so, awesome. All right, I'm excited. Oh my gosh. So, when it comes to enjoying food, enjoying wine together, really do it the way that you enjoy it. Um, we're not telling you, like, evaluate the food, evaluate the wine. It's really meant to be a casual experience. So, I'm gonna take a little drink of wine because I usually like wine more than food. Cassandra Law says, great job, Adam. Thank you, Cassandra, we really appreciate it. All right, you know, in something like this, oh, look at that, just like one nice slice. Um, we're gonna get a little bit of fennel. We're gonna get a little bit of couscous. We're gonna get a little bit of olive. And so what we're looking for here is those deep, rich rub flavors the cocoa bean, the thyme, the cocoa nibs, the coffee, all of that sort of being an underlying character behind the fresh anise, the bright acidity, uh, that texture, the fattiness, bringing all of these together. Mm. That's great. I mean, I feel weird saying that's great because I made it, but I'm really stoked. I hope you're really stoked on this dish too. Um, this is one of my favorites. We're going to be continuing this series. We're going to keep talking about interesting things, things that are, that are not, you know, burrata and chardonnay or cabernet and steak. Um, we're going to keep looking at interesting ways to make food and wine really compatible make it enjoyable, make it easy to understand, and make it easy to do at home. Um, you're home, you're not going out, you might as well be cooking things that um, really impress you and your family and your friends and neighbors. So, um, if you have any questions, if you need more wine, reach out to us. Again, we're drinking that 2017 Cave Estate Cabernet Sauvignon Howl Mountain, our very smallest production uh, considering the vintage. We're really, really, very, very proud of the wine. Very proud of Danielle and her winemaking team up there on Howell Mountain. Um, and it's our pleasure to write dishes uh, and recipes that go with these wines. So thank you and enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>